And it's a very good evening to everyone. Here we are on Monday night, June 12th, and it's going to be another great session about having to do with now. I think tonight's going to be the shifting up and shifting down. But as always, we want to start by offering up time if people have any questions on things that Aaron has already talked about that you need him to go into a little bit more. Um, Go ahead and ask away, and if not, shortly we'll, Aaron will go ahead and get started on this next section. Yep, we got everybody unmuted, so yeah, if there is any questions, whether that's from past webinars the last week or so since Dr. Tudor's been on vacation, or if something has just popped up and you're curious and looking for an answer, by all means, ask away. Hi, Erin. Hi again. I have a question about leads. Mm -hmm. Assuming I use leads every day, uh, how often do I need to change it, the leads? Especially when you see some wiggly or crispy or whatever abnormal waves. It's so time, yeah, to change leads. Perfect question would be are you using our leads or are you buying leads from a different source uh yes everywhere okay i actually mixed yours and others and to the point i don't even know which side is yours anymore okay so let's start first of all mixed metals is a no-no um, um, so you always want to make sure all the leads that are attached to your client are exactly the same. So whether that's all leads you've got from Newmind, or let's say well, IMA, he's, they're still selling his, but he went out of business, he finally retired. Um, but you wanna make sure you don't use mixed metals because you will get very irregular signals. Um, you know, Jason and I have, eh, had uh, tech calls where initially we're kind of pulling our hair out trying to figure out what's going on and then it comes out that you know they're using two gold sensors two silver sensors and a tin sensor and that's why the signal is so distorted so that would be my first suggestion is making sure um, they're all from the same manufacturer um, as far as changing them out so with the leads that we sell now, Dr. Suter spent a long time you know, working through different manufacturers to find a company that was reliable, that they were sturdy. Um, when I started here over a year and a half ago, um, and they sent me leads and equipment, I told Dr. Suter I was gonna treat them as bad as I could. I was gonna be the worst technician with the leads. I wasn't gonna clean them constantly. I was gonna wipe them with any type of material I had at hand. Um, I wasn't you know, gonna do a lot of stuff that I would recommend to people to do with their leads every day. Um, and it's been a year and a half later now, granted, you know, I only train a few days a week using my leads. Um, a year and a half later, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. And I know Judy, I remember Judy made a comment ooh, quite some time ago. Um, there was a question going around the listserv. And Judy had mentioned that she was going on like three years. Um, Honestly, there are some of them that's probably more than three years. Um, the maintenance that we do is really very simple. Uh, I, actually, Aaron, you probably taught it to me when I first started. We just wipe them down with a, an alcohol wipe, actually and we're just careful and cautious with them. And the only time that I replace them is when I'm trying to source a problem on how the tracings are coming in. Mm -hmm. So that's really what makes me change leads. I mean, yes, I, I mean, look, somebody, I bought a batch from somebody who was retiring I, and they, I, uh, they sent, I, I bought something and they sent me a box of leads now. They were rusty, they were disgusting. And, you know, so it's really a lot about what you do with them. Also, ear clips, you know, that curly part. I mean, we're fanatical about keeping everything clean. 
and they just last and last and last. Yep, and I think probably when I worked with your clinic years ago, Judy, you know, the basic recommendation was, yeah, I mean, so back then, um, the leads that were supplied from that company were made by IMA Electronics. They were gold plated. Um, first of all, I'm not a fan of gold plate uh, because eventually the gold plating will start chipping off. And as soon as that gold starts to chip, now what you have underneath that is the base metals that they use in the plating process. So you got zinc and nickels and other stuff that they have to apply first to get the gold to adhere um, when they go to plate that. So when gold chips off, um, you're now left with these base metals exposed. And if you, those of us can remember back to our school days, and I'm talking like early school days, where your science teacher had you make a battery with uh, two nails and a small flashlight bulb, you know, and by shoving these nickel nails into the potato, you would actually generate electricity. Uh, the same thing applies with gold plated leads. When that gold chips off, you're going to get a reaction there um, with the salts in their skin. Now, granted, we are prepping with rubbing alcohol, but it's still, you know, you're still going to get some skin oils in there. Um, so that can really mess up with the signal. So I'm a huge fan of just the solid silver ones that Dr. Suter sourced. Um, they always give me a constant, reliable signal. Um, you know, and what I tell everybody is if you're going to buy leads from us, even if you only do two-channel training, buy the four-channel electrode sets. Because right. that way, if any one of those cup sensors fails, you now have two backup sensors. And you spent an extra $40 initially which now you can just pull those backup sensors out instead of having to turn around and buy you know, a whole new set of two channel leads for like 140. Um, and then definitely uh, cleaning the cups out. The way I do it, if I'm actually wanna do it properly and treat my leads right, um, I just start with a paper towel on these solid silvers. I wipe the excess off. And then I always generally have an alcohol wipe there. Um, and then I use, um, for my new prep, I use the six inch wooden swabs with just the cotton on one end. So to thoroughly clean the cups out, what I do is I just wrap an alcohol wipe around the end of that swab and it fits in there perfectly. And I just give it like a quarter twist on each one. Um, and then with me, um, I don't rinse mine under warm water very often. Uh, but training clinics, you know, and when I worked in a clinic, you know, having like eight people come through a room in a day, I always made sure I took my leads to the sink at the end of the day and I run them under warm water. And as long as the water isn't too hot to hurt your hand, um, it's going to be fine on the leads. So what that does is it rinses off any paste residue. You know, since we are using the 1020 conductive paste, just the conductive nature of that 1020 paste, if you don't get all the residue off, what ends up happening is you'll start noticing you get this kind of funky green patina finish that can kind of start building up. Generally, it's around like the heat shrink tubing. Um, and that's, it's corrosive. And if that gets underneath that heat shrink tubing, it can start eating away at the solder joints and I've actually seen cases like that where, you know, the electrode end was still affixed, but the only thing that was holding it in place was the heat shrink tubing. You know, the solder joint underneath had gotten so weak that it cracked um, and signal was completely unstable. They go from what looked like no lead attached to having a lead attached and back. And that was just as that wire moved around slightly when it would break connection with the sensor, we'd lose the signal. And then if the wire got bumped a little bit, or for that matter, a little gust of air blew on it and kind of moved it, we'd get a slight connection again. So <clears throat> as far as changing them out, um, if, if 
I go back to my days in the clinic using IMA leads, I changed them out every 500 to 750 sessions, regardless of their performance. Um, and my thought pattern on that, and this is how I explained it to the physician I worked for, is, you know, the leads are the heart of the system when we're training people. Um, and I want to make sure that the training sessions that I did on a brand new set of leads, um, that the sessions, you know, going past that are just as good. And, you know, we charged, well, if you go to a la carte price, let's say $100 a session, you know, we would get $50,000, you know, out of a set of leads before we changed it out. Now, if they were still performing, what I would do is I would put them into a little Ziploc sandwich bag, I would write the date on it, and I would put them in a drawer. And then those were my backup backup leads. Um, I always had a brand new set waiting on the shelf, um, but I also had two rooms running. Um, so I didn't wanna keep a ton of overstock of supplies if I didn't have to. So that's where the used leads would come in. If I did have a lead break in a room, I could go get one of the old ones that I know technically was still working and I can attach it to the equipment um, and order a new set right away. Generally have those in in three or four days and then I would take the old one, put it back in its bag, put the new set on. And then if, if the set I was using was broken, I would just dispose of those. I wouldn't keep them. Um, but yeah, really, it depends on the manufacturer, um, quality. Um, you know, it's just like anything else. You know, you kind of get what you pay for in electrodes. You know, so if you're buying really inexpensive tin ones, you're probably not going to get too much use out of them. Um, the big thing is just watching your waveforms. You know, and you know, if, I know you've been. Um, doing neurofeedback in a clinic for a while. So you kind of know the difference of what a normal EEG signal looks like versus something that's starting to change or look different. Um, that's when I would change them out. You know, if I see any abnormalities, um, repetitive patterns, that's when the leads are, are gonna get pulled and a new set's put on. Hey, Aaron. Yeah. I've got about three questions. Um, one, why wouldn't you Dip them in real hot water, and then uh, there's. Uh, I've used the IMA beaters, um, silver, and when they get tarnished, I'm trying to remember what what's the soda. You put the soda and some tin uh, tin foil and dip them, and it's like it, it takes the tarnish right. Up. Well, it usually takes the tarnish off. Um, that's the second sort of question. And then the third one is, um, I guess if you're soldering, do they have to use silver solder if it's a silver electrode? And are the wires silver? And what causes the breakdown? I'm up to about four questions. I'm sorry. What causes <laughs> the breakdown in the metals over time, which may be beyond my end to grasp if you get too technical. But anyway. Yeah, so hot water... Um, I knew clinics that used to keep in a little electronic teapot. Yeah. Um, and they they dipped their leads. They had no problems. I'm always just worried about melting rubber and plastics. You know, if the water was too hot, you know, the potential damage to the, the coatings. Not that it's, it's definitely not going to hurt the solder joint. It's not going to hurt the actual sensor itself. Um, but if you're, definitely if you're gonna do something like that, even if it's, you know, a teapot that has an adjustable setting, and, cause what they would do is after every session, they would just dip the leads in the, the teapot, pull them out, wipe them off with a cloth, and they were ready to go for the next client. I, I know, would, I've seen but, people that use that. I felt sorry for whoever. At the end of the day, has to empty that thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This clinic, they um, when they got back from lunch, they would empty it out and refill it. And um, they took my advice on that, and they made sure they had a. They bought 
gallon of distilled water. You know, that way there was no issues with like heavy mineral deposits being transferred onto the leads. Um, it was just nice, clean, pure water, um, you know, with no minerals, no calcium, you know, anything else in it. Um, as far as the solder goes, every set of leads I've ever dissected, um, it's just standard solder, you know, that you would use in electronics, um, you know, like a tin based. Um, and the wire, you know, most of the wiring is copper wire. Um, so I've never seen any manufacturer that, at least the ones I've looked at, there might be some out there, um, but every lead manufacturer always just uses copper strand wire um, and just standard tin leads like you would use on a circuit board um, to put them together. Um, I'm confusing my words carefully here. I had a client once who I was going to do some forehead training, and he mentioned that he had an active, I want to say maybe it was a strep infection on his forehead. And mm -hmm. I immediately switched to parietal training. <laughs> uh, there is an issue, I know like um, beauticians and barbers have to soak their scissors in Protex. some special stuff. Protex, yeah. I think, is one. Mm -hmm. And with COVID, or if you're treating anyone remotely near an HIV population, there's sort of issues beyond warm water, I would think. Mm -hmm. And alcohol. The other, oh, the other thing just occurred to me. I was surprised to learn that supposedly, I always thought stronger was better, but was it 70% isopropyl alcohol is better mm -hmm. than 90 or 100%? And it has something to do with how quick it kills the shell, but it doesn't go in and kill the bug inside the shell. Mm -hmm. So that's something worth noting. Yes. Yeah, I would always recommend 70% isopropyl, especially for leads. And you, know, you could even soak the leads for a short period of time in alcohol and you won't damage them instead of just simply wiping them. Um, you, know, you could have a small cup, you know, maybe the size of a shot glass or something, so you don't waste a bunch of rubbing alcohol. Just pour it in there and soak them, you know, between clients. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Some um, people use the barbasol. Um, that's yep. supposed to be wrong. Yep, barbasol you can do. Um, you know, there is the Metricide 28 for disinfecting QEG caps. Um, but the Metricide 28, their disinfection length is like, I say, eight to 12 hours that you have to soak in that solution to completely disinfect the cap. Um, so yeah, long, long overnight soak. Um, but leads, I think, you know, you're talking about metal, a um, lot different than like the fabric of a cap. So I think a short soak in, yeah, anything like a Barbasol, rubbing alcohol would be enough to kill any small infections. And then the tarnish, you know, one thing that comes to my mind for tarnish, and I've used this for you know, 20 years. Um, I used to use it working on my cars when I was a kid, uh, but it's it's metal wadding um, polish. So it's basically this metal tin can and inside it there is cotton wadding um, that is um, not like saturated to the point where it's dripping, but it's there's definitely a solution on it. Um, and that's great for you know, like, um, like copper decorations in your house. Um, it'll clean the tarnish off silverware. Um, so clean the tarnish as well off leads. I would just make sure it's after, if you use something like that, you just want to thoroughly clean it. I'd probably wipe them or soak them in some rubbing alcohol, you know, and then run them under some hot water just to make sure that none of that residue is left. Um, but that works really well for tarnish. Um, 
And I'm assuming there's probably some natural tarnish removers using like baking soda or something that you could do yeah, I, as well. It's not baking soda. I think it's washing soda. It's it's not baking soda. It's some I, uh, I think it's under washing soda. You have to get it at like hardware store or somewhere or really look for it. And then a, a piece of tin foil in a cup and then you know some hot water it foams up nicely and you make sure the metals touch the tin foil and then the tin foil comes out tarnished. And the sensors are usually less tarnished, if not sparkly. Oops, that sounds almost like a weird electrolysis process going on that's pulling it off with the reaction. It is. It is, yeah. And it's it's kind of fun. It foams up a little bit. <laughs> um, back in the days when some people I knew had silver plate, they would clean it that way when it tarnished. And it beats rubbing and it you know, it's pretty simple, and the stuff is very cheap. You know, I, you buy a can of it, and it'll outlast you. You can remember the name, post that up on the list, sir, because that would be a, definitely a better alternative than what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Uh, what I'm thinking of is definitely there's chemicals involved, so if somebody has you know, sensitive skin, might irritate you. I've never had a problem with it personally, but you know, I've never really had a problem with chemicals irritating me severely uh, so yeah a natural alternative would definitely be a good option for people uh, luckily i've never had mine tarnish yet but it doesn't mean they won't um, i guess it just depends on how long you use them for and how well you clean them was there another question in there michael that No, we get them all. Um, no, I think we're good. Thanks. Oh, about yeah. the metal breaking down over time, which I don't need the answer, but I was. Uh, That's more of the solder and the wires because, and it, it comes down, it's primarily more of the, the copper wiring they use. You know, it's no different than somebody who puts. Um, decorative copper on a house and doesn't seal it you know just from the acids and the chemicals in rainwater um, will start reacting with the copper metal and then you get that nice green kind of copper patina that some people like when they decorate the outside of their houses so that's what's really happening it's it's the conductive properties in the paste that ends up reacting with the copper wiring if it gets way down in that heat shrink tubing and then it starts just eating away um, and then you start getting breaks in the wiring um, i have seen solder joints that crack but that was um, i had ordered some leads from a company in china that was when Dieter from IMA, he injured his hand. He couldn't make leads for like two months and I was running low. Um, so I found this company, they were reasonably priced, um, ordered them and uh, really wasn't happy with the end outcome because as I started sending leads out to customers, uh, within a week I started getting calls that the cups were just falling out. Um, their solder joints weren't um, solid. And every lead that came back, it was just cracks in the solder joints. Um, you know, so luckily they remade the whole batch and they actually worked, but, um, but yeah, the, the solder joints I've seen crack and then the rest of the corrosion is more of just the mixing of the copper with um, kind of that patina effect that you can get. But, you know, if you wash your leads and warm the hot water, you know, once a day at least, you know, it'll melt all that away. And you shouldn't really have a problem with that green gooey um, patina kind of gunk you see that builds up on them. All right. Other questions before we kind of 
move along. More than happy to field any more if you got them. Okay. So I'm going to go through uh, some of these slides. So looking at who's on here, I think, I think everyone hopefully should have exposure to this. Uh, but since these are going to be recorded and posted up on our YouTube channel in the, the New Mind Software Training section. Um, there's, I know some people out there that aren't really aware of using the shift function, what it's there for, why we use it. Um, and I've actually seen quite a few maps that have been submitted for Lunch and Learns, where it was an obvious, a low power map, um, but the clinician who sent it in didn't provide a shifted map like they should have, um, so we could get you know, good clear visual on what was going on. So uh, some of these slides you'll see are gonna be in a mini queue format. Some of these are in 19 point old slides, um, but it's all the same information. So I think we're all aware when you go in and look at an eyes open or eyes closed map for a client, underneath the magnitude section, you see this magnitude contrast. By default, when you upload a map, it's going to be at zero. And then we see there's a plus one, a plus two, and a minus one, and a minus two. So what these buttons are doing is um, adding standard deviations. So we can add one standard deviation, or we can add two standard deviations of power to the whole magnitude section, or we can take away one or two standard deviations um, if it's a high power. So, you know, the purpose of the shift function, uh, number one is to inspect and compare the amplitudes between component bands with respect to a normative distribution. So when the majority of head map locations in all bands are below the norm or blue, we're gonna shift up. And when the majority of the head map locations in all bands are above the norm or red, we're gonna shift down. Now, before we go any farther, there is a certain amount that qualifies for what we're gonna talk about coming up. So we're gonna talk about low power people, high power people. So a low power, you're gonna need 70% of delta, theta, alpha, and beta to all be blue. It doesn't matter if they're light blue or dark blue, but just 70%. Um, so if you had all of beta low, you've got 25%. If we had all of alpha low, now we're up to 50. So now we just need another 20% out of delta and theta to qualify them as a definite low power or just on the opposite side, a high power, same thing. 70% of the map at a normed zero would need to be all red and yellow. You don't see quite as many of the high powers there's a small percentage, if I remember right from Dr. Suter, it's about, I wanna say 6% roughly, could be plus or minus a percent or two of that. Um, whereas low power, it's more like about 17%, uh, you'll have low power. So that's why if you have to shift the map, it's generally you're shifting up. So here is kinda what we're doing when we shift. You know, so this would be, um, an eyes closed like distribution of power. If we think of distribution of power like a mountain, so an eyes closed alpha is the dominating frequency band, and then you'll have theta just below that, and then delta and beta at the lowest. So when we have a low power map, you know, we're not really seeing what's going on with delta and theta and beta. You know, this would be like a case of alpha. Um, so we're just seeing maybe a little bit of greens in the map, but then we see a considerable amount of light blues and dark blues. So when we shift the map up, think of it like this norm line doesn't move. We're just pushing the whole mountain up. You know, we're pushing up either one or two standard deviations. And now we can actually start to, number one, we can see what's going on with them as far as you know, is there more delta than everything else? Then that would be a low power slow map. 
or do we shift it up and do we see beta dominates the playing field? And that would be a low power fast map, which we'll go through those here in a minute. Uh, but that's the basic principle. Now, if you had a high power map, you know, the mountain would be, you know, the base of the mountain would be way up here. So when we lower, do a minus one or a minus two in the magnitude contrast, we're bringing that mountain down. Normal line staying the same. And we're just now kind of starting to see uh, more variation in the map. Instead of seeing the whole map yellow, you know, as we go down one or two standard deviations, we notice certain frequency bands drop to in reds. Some might drop all the way into greens. I've seen them, some drop even like as low as light blues. But that's the purpose of this shift function. Um, now, there are times where you may upload an EEG, and let's say it's just delta and theta are all yellow. You know, but your alpha, you got some greens, you got a few reds, maybe beta is primarily all green. You know, and your big question is, well, what's worse? You know, is it delta or is it theta? You know, so you can just simply use the negative one, negative two button in a case like that to start taking a little power weight and see what stays yellow and what stays, what turns to red or maybe even what turns all the way to green. You know, and it just gives you that ability to really kind of move the map around to see, you know, what's the worst of the worst that I have to deal with? Is it primarily delta? Is it primarily theta? Or could be one of the other component bands? You know, and here we can see, I'll zoom in a little. So, and this is what happens in a map. So when we have this low power, we can see here, we've got almost solid low power. So we're running, 85, 90% all low in delta, theta, alpha, and beta. And we can see that this map was, that's zeroed out as it was recorded. And then in this case, <clears throat> it took a, a two standard deviation increase of power to actually see what's going on now. Um, and in this case, this is actually what we would call a low power fast map. Just meaning that it starts all low power at the zeroed out, but then once we shift it up, so not only we, but the database can really see what's going on, we look at what frequency band is dominating the playing field. So betas are fastest frequency, so that's where we get the low power fast from. Now, if we started up here again, all low power, and we shift it up, let's say plus two again, um, and Beta was relatively normal, but delta was all red and yellow, uh, or even theta in there. That's what we call low power slow map. So the low power is just tells us, you know, is this person that we're working on, is their average amplitude lower than the norm group population? And then the slow and the fast that we add in is when we do bring it up to the norm group, is it our slow waves dominating the playing field, delta and beta, or is it the fast wave of beta? Um, my, from what I see most of the time, you get more low power slow maps. It's just what you see out there. Every once in a while, I see a low power fast, but for the most part, it's low power slows. All right. And so, Occasionally, you do get this adjust up suggested. So shifting is not required in every case. So in most cases, the shift is only recommended to assist in map analysis and provide better component band contrast. That's what we were just talking about, like with the delta and theta, just kind of moving it around so we can see what's the worst of the worst. Um, the shift is not, not a required function, but only meant to be a convenience. So in a lot of cases, if they're not a low power or if they're not a high power, the, the shift function was just added in there as a convenience to kind of see how all the frequency bands are playing with one another, especially if you get multiple frequency bands that are identical. So in the low power maps, we're gonna break it down um, into three different categories. Um, we've already kind of talked about this. We have a low power fast or low voltage fast. Um, low power slow and a low power normal. Now, 
in clinics, we'll regularly see low power slows. Um, that's, you know, again, starting with low power, when we shift up delta and theta, it takes over as the highest amplitude. We talked about the fast, that would be beta, takes over as the dominant um, amplitude. We generally won't see a low power normal in a new client because low power normal people can pass any cognitive, any emotional battery test you throw at them. Um, so with a low power normal, you'll upload the EDF files and everything's gonna be blue across the board. And then when you hit a, either a plus one or a plus two, pretty much the whole map goes almost solid green. You get a few light blues and a few reds scattered throughout. Um, and that's a low power normal. You know, so again, you probably only see that person in a clinic if you just had a curious person. You know, maybe a friend of theirs came into your clinic and got a map done and was telling them all about it. Um, and then they're just curious to see, you know, what does, what does my brain look like? You know, that's, I think, about the only time any one of us would actually see that in a clinical setting. Um, so the first example here is a low power fast map. And this is kind of what was used above. So we can see map definitely qualifies. We've got 70% or more low power. And then next slide, we'll see what they shifted up. And this low power fast is very common um, in the alcoholic population. You'll see this. So here's the shifted up. You know, so again, we're starting all low power. We add our standard deviations of power, and now the fast frequency of beta dominates the playing field. So there's our low power fast. Um, here's a low power slow, um, typical in TBI cases, dementia, Parkinson, um, those exposed with high levels of neurotoxins. And here, we can already tell it's gonna be a low power slow. So we've got our 70% here with theta, alpha, and beta being low. But we notice delta is already normal and we already have F3 coming in at a standard deviation above normal. So if we just think about it a second, if we start adding more power or more amplitude to this map, these greens are gonna turn red or yellow. And then the rest of these are probably gonna come up to a little bit more normal. And that's what we see here. So here's our slow wave delta dominating the playing field. Uh, Alpha, we got a few little lows, we got a couple of reds and, and beta. We're gonna discard the T4 though, that's false positive because the artifact here in high beta. Um, so this is your low power slow. Now, one of the questions that always comes up from clinics is when we start talking about protocols on these, especially the low power slow maps, um, because once we shift this up, so the database is probably gonna be recommending protocol one on this client, you know, because really it's just the delta that needs to come down. Um, they'll probably use, use some obscure protocol in the back um, with like a beta up to get the compensatory change, um, you know, the increase of blood perfusion by increasing beta, which in turn will bump up some of the theta. So we'd probably see that little obscure protocol in the mix as well. Um, but the question comes in is, well, why would I want to decrease this delta when it was normal here? You know, wouldn't I want to increase all the rest of this? And the answer to that question is no. Um, generally, once you have somebody who's low power, they're always going to be low power. Um, you're never going to get them up to an all green map. So what we do instead is we turn them into a low power normal. So we would start, in this case, we'd start running protocols, decreasing some delta in the frontal, temporal, and posterior section. And what that's gonna do is as you continue to remap them, the delta is gonna start progressively turning more blue. So by the time you're done with this client, hopefully what you would end up seeing is that, you know, you have pretty much all blue across the board, 
And when you add like a standard deviation of power, everything pretty come, comes up to almost a normal, you know, power range. Um, you know, so, and you'll get that where it's sometimes you shift up and it's delta and theta is all red and yellow. Same thing, we'd be using a protocol four, it's bringing delta and theta down and eventually, hopefully achieving low power normal. And the closer you get them to that low power normal, uh, as you start watching progress trackers, you know, you should see improvement in uh, their symptoms. Uh, so according to Niedemeyer, um, so up to, there's a percentage, up to 15% of the population has a low power EEG with a normal distribution. These individuals appear and function normally in all respects. Um, they appear similar to the other low power subtypes on the normative map system because their variance is not detectable by such a system. So this is our low power normal. So Peter Meyer's research back in 2006 discovered that about 15% of the population um, had this low power um, normal map. And here is what a low power normal would look like if you ever got one in your clinic or if you started with, let's say, a low power slow or low power fast, um, by the time you get them through training, you know, you're gonna see their maps looks more, you know, pretty much blue across the board. And then we notice here with just one standard deviation of power added, we get a pretty much normal map. And I've had clinics say, well, what does normal look like? Should it be all green? And it's like, you know, you're never gonna get all green. Um, I learned that from Dr. Souter years ago. Um, most of you probably know that, um, you know, so we've got a little bit, you know, a little bit of some light blues here, posterior and theta. So yeah, they might have a little short-term working memory issues, um, but everything else is pretty much within a normal range. Everything's looking pretty good. Uh, so individuals with a low power are typically very difficult if not impossible to uptrain into normal range with neurofeedback because our EEG profile is either due to severe metabolic depletions or genetic determination. It is more reasonable to attempt to adjust their distribution closer to the low power normal profile than to expect their entire power spectrum to increase. And we were just talking about that. Um, so when we're doing this magnitude shift, um, we're sh the shifting involves shifting the total EEG power up into a more normal range so that the database can quote unquote see it and register the relationship of the component bands as if they were normal. This provides a more accurate representation of the relationship of the component bands for the purpose of assessment and attaining our protocols. Um, so people will ask that question too. Well, when I shift the map, what is that going to do to dominant frequency, interconnectivity, and asymmetry? And the answer to that question is absolutely nothing. Now, when you use the magnitude contrast shift, it's in the name there. It's the magnitude. That's all we're adjusting. Your dominant frequency, your interconnectivity, your asymmetry will stay the same. Um, your protocols will change, though, just so everyone's clear on that. Um, once you shift a map, into a more normal range, whether that's shifting up or shifting down, the database will now be able to actually see that distribution of power better, and it will change the protocols accordingly to what it sees. Um, we can also use the midline on the dashboard just to kind of determine the degree um, of deviance, you know, between that. So. Um, in this midline analysis, if you guys aren't aware, each one of these horizontal lines is a standard deviation of power. You know, so when we're looking at like alpha here, we can see this alpha is one, two, about two and a half standard deviations below what norm should be. You know, so that's letting us know we've got considerable low power versus theta is about a standard deviation here below in the frontal. Same with the delta back here in the parietals. Um, you know, so if you ever look at the midline and you see the gray lines are all up high and your colored lines are way at the bottom, you've got an extreme low power climb. There are probably at least two or more standard deviations uh, below what the norm range is. And the same applies if they're the colored lines above these, you can just count 
and get your standard deviations of power. Uh, so when the map power or magnitude is too low for the database to read, um, occasionally it will recommend a shift up. And I haven't seen this in quite some time. And I, I would have to talk to Dr. Suter and our development team uh, to see if they've changed that. But I remember when I first started um, using this database years and years ago, this is what you would see in the protocols um, if the map, if the amplitude and magnitude was either all very low or all very high. The database would actually wouldn't even generate protocols. It would force you to go shift and then you would get protocols. Um, so a shift up will result in the generation of new protocols based on the upshifted distribution as interpreted by the map system. We were just talking about that. So now if you started with this, you shift it up. Now you've actually, the database can see the relationship of um, the amplitude and make some actual good recommendations. Uh, fail safe or low magnitude database. Um, and so occasionally this used to happen. And again, we don't really see that now. Uh, but you I have, shift I have up. not seen that, Aaron. And yeah. I have not seen that in at least five years yeah. on any yeah, of so my maps. So I'm assuming something Dr. Suter had the software development team um, for the database make some adjustments. Because, um, yeah, I haven't either with all the clinics I work with. That has been long gone for quite some time. Um, in a case like this, um, you know, you would still, this is low power, we'd still shift up. We could simply choose to run the one available protocol and then remap when we're done with that. That would be an option. Um, in conflicting protocols. Uh, so if a protocol is recommended for a low power map and the shifting procedure produces other protocols, and you are unsure which version of the protocol to use, then use the protocol that's associated with the CEC dashboard. Okay, so those of you that actually have your clients fill out the CEC, and I hope that's majority of you, um, you know you get that predictive map that comes up, and that predictive map is based off how they answer their questions, not anything to do with the brain activity recorded. So in a case like this where the unshifted map produced a protocol three at the prefrontals, and then you shift it, and now we've got a protocol 10 at F3, F4, and a 20 at 0102. We could simply go look at their CEC results, look at that predictive map, and kind of see, do we see prefrontals lit up more than anything else? Do we see the frontals lit up? Do we see the occipitals lit up? You know, and kind of utilize that predictive map to help us determine you know, potentially where we want to train with this client. Um, we're almost at the end. So one thing I want to mention about shifting. So if you jump right to the dashboard after uploading a client's uh, recording, and you'll notice, um, I don't have it in here, it's not broken down, but you guys will notice if you're looking at the clinical dashboard, you'll have the neurogenic and psychogenic section. If you're just looking at the client dashboard, you'll have the physical and mental section. If majority of the symptoms that the client reported on show up in either the mental or psychogenic section, there is a really good possibility you've got a low power map on your hands. So at that point, I don't waste any more time looking at the dashboards. I immediately jump to their eyes closed map because that's where I'm going to make my initial determination of low power or high power. And based on what I see there, I'll start shifting the map up. Now, Dr. Suter and I do the shift two different ways. Um, him and I have talked about this. We both get the same results. Um, so what I've always done, let's see if I can find the one, is I shift up until theta pretty much normalizes. You know, whether that's a plus one or a plus two. You know, if theta turns all red and yellow, going to a plus two, I back it down to plus one. It'll look something like this. And generally, 
once I do that, if I go back to my dashboard, I'll notice a good majority of the psychogenic symptoms are now up in the neurogenic section. Um, what Dr. Souter does is he, he just does an extra step. Um, he'll add a standard deviation of power, and then he goes and looks at the dashboard and sees what that plus one did with those uh, psychogenic symptoms. If he still sees a bunch of psychogenic symptoms, he'll go back to a plus two, and then go back to his dashboard and look for the results. Um, so him and I talked about that five or six years ago, uh, and how I did it versus he did it. And we both kind of came to the conclusion, he did more than me, that yeah, that's that was a fine way to go. Um, so however you want to do it, it doesn't really take that much longer to, to do it the way Dr. Souter does. Um, so keep that in mind. Use those psychogenic symptoms. It's kind of a guide to know if you've shifted it far enough or if you need to go one more. Um, and we'll just kind of finish off here. You know, this is what a high power would look like. Um, so again, we've got over 70% of the eyes closed magnitude, all high power. Keep in mind, we're always using eyes closed for this determination. Um, and also, whatever you shift the eyes closed, you have to shift the eyes open the same. So don't just shift the eyes closed and leave the eyes open alone. You will need to shift it up. And even if the eyes open turns into a mess like this, when you shift it up, like plus one or whatever, that's technically how your client is presenting to the world. So that's where we want it. Um, and again, we talked about this, the high amplitude population is a very small subset. Um, and the research is unclear, um, especially for high power. You know, low power, there are theories, but I have yet to hear any research that offers concrete evidence of why our clients present as low power. Again, there's those theories that it's metabolic issues, genetics, uh, but no one's pinned it down. You know, so if anybody's wondering, is there something you can do um, on the health side? There's nothing that I'm aware of. I'm also not trained in functional medicine. So for those of you that uh, are, if you guys know any tricks of the trade to help with that, by all means, throw that stuff up on the list, sir. Um, Aaron, is, I, is skull, the skull thickness factor in at all? Yes. In some cases, I see that more um, down the midline, um, where in some people, um, as that mid-sagittal lines, you know, kind of they start closing up the older they get. I have seen people that... Um, especially down the midline, we see a lot of issues. Um, but yeah, I would assume if you've got somebody with more of a thickness, like a Neanderthal style skull, um, that you could pick that up. Um, also keep in mind any severe head injuries can show up. So um, if they've had bone grafts, um, of course, metal plates are a no-no. Um, but I have seen maps that Client didn't ask the or the clinic didn't ask the question to the client, um, and come to find out the client actually had um, a head injury years back, and they had a metal plate, and that's a client. The clinic couldn't figure out why, just this one section, you know, and it was up uh, kind of F4 area, why it was kind of dark blue across the board, you know, and it was either faulty cap. You know, and they had a bunch of crud built up in their sensors, you know, or there was something to do with the client when they investigated that, come to find out there was a metal plate and that was blocking the power. Um, I, had one, sure. yeah. I had one person that had no metal plate, but there was a silver dollar size hole and the skull, you know, this it was the soft part because there was no skull plate there it had been removed after head injury so that was weird um how, I, I don't even know how you would even know if someone had a thick skull other than thumping it like a melon um yeah. mri 
would really be the only way to I can think of to measure skull thickness. Yeah, uh, I mean, but that's research. You're not going to do that clinically. No, definitely not. Um, you know, so I guess we're just going to assume most of our clients, you know, have an average skull thickness. But I have seen that mid sagittal line that um, comes up with issues here and there. Um, I don't see it a lot, but I have seen it um, in the past where you'll get. Um, especially like FZCZ. Um, I worked with just 12 point mini cues for years. We didn't record PZ, so I can't comment there, but definitely um, I've seen it at FZ and CZ where um, when those suture lines seal up, they just get a little bit extra bone there and you'll get some lower power. Um, but really in, in most cases, as far as protocol production goes, that doesn't, really mean anything to us because our database never recommends training at FZ and CZ. Um, I know there are protocols that, that we use at FZ and CZ, like the one Rob recommended on the last webinar, um, or doing SMR training. Of course, we're going to be at CZ or um, proportional tones back at PZ. Uh, but that's generally where I see most of the issues would be down the midline, really not anywhere else. So it's 8.05. Yeah. I suggest we hold the next set of questions until Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can pick up here. Any questions? Just, that was the last slide. We ripped through it pretty quick. Um, wow. So yeah, we can uh, pick up any questions on Everybody Wednesday. Everybody will have time to think about some mm -hmm. of this about the shifting. And then we'll continue this or what your next topic will be. Yep, I'm thinking about adding in some stuff on home training, um, just because I know I'm, I look down the list of people that join us on the Lunch and Learn. Some people are heavily into home training. Some people um, have never even ventured into that. So we can kind of talk about the basics maybe of home training, and then we can also talk about any issues that come up and some troubleshooting stuff for home trainers to think about. Um, so we'll leave that out there if that's um, a topic that people want Sounds to hear Sounds good. Um, so uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, folks, and we'll see you Wednesday at noon or noon Eastern time. Let me put it that way. Early, early for Hana. Good night. <laughs> okay, see you Wednesday. Yeah, that's Later. right. Normally I don't come at uh, 6 a.m. <laughs> 6 a.m., right? <laughs> yeah. Really okay. See you Wednesday, folks.